of saints, my son, hear the instruction of your father. I do not forsake the law of your mother. In Job it says, wisdom is with aged men, and with the lamp of days and understanding. In Leviticus it speaks of rising up before the gray-headed, and honoring the presence of the old man. We need these things back. Our world is dying. Bring them back. Take me back to the old time days My grandmother always used to say Respect for each other goes a long, long, long way Be careful what you use your tongue to say I know your mama and dad then you will live long days Why can't things be just like in the old time days them days gone, Laurie Leon, man, it's time to move on. Forward, ever backward, never to the future and beyond. At least I know it in only me one. That feel like the way that we dealing going wrong. I guess that's why I choose to join with you to do this song. It's not a lamentation, it's a celebration of the fact that many of we still got the motivation to step back, get back on track and attack the problem from another angle. We can bring back the past, but we could get the present handle, sing the anthem. Take me back to the old time days. My grandmother always used to say, respect for each other goes a long, long, long way. Do that. Be careful what you use your tongue to say. I know your mom and dad, then you will live long days. Why can't things be just like in the old time days? All in all, I know we've come a long way. But somewhere on the journey, it seems like we've gone astray. One day, we got to get back on course. Like a winding river returning to the source, of course, you know, the going will be slow. The path will be punctuated with highs and lows, hits and blows, yeses and noes. But heaven knows it's in the midst of difficulty that my spirit grows from the tip of my toes right up to the top of my head. I won't stop fighting for rights until I am dead. May my children carry on in my righteous footsteps and forgive all the negatives I have left. Yes. For the last decade we have watched as our children have grown more violent, more rude, more disrespectful, more unwilling to work, unwilling to live honestly. It's to the point now where children are killing children and running drugs in schools. When will we act against this deliberate and systematic destruction of life? Are we going to just sit and let our world be ruled by violence and hate? This is the time to take action. This is the time to affect change in our communities. We need to change. We need to return to the days of old when respect was earned and not bought. Take me back to the old time days. My grandmother always used to say, respect for each other goes a long, long, long way. What you use your tongue to say I know your mom and dad that you would live long days Why can't things be just like in the old time days? Do you understand the power of the word? Life and death is on the tongue We can bring them forward again From the days we are back when Women was women and men was men. And community was all we together in harmony. Why can't things be just like in the old time days? Why can't things be just like in the old time days? On you, we depend it.
Good evening all. Welcome to our public lecture series 2024. First, some housekeeping. On exiting the room to your right is the washroom for the female. Male's washroom. I would ask each and every one of you to engage the At this time, we wish you to assume a position of respect for the playing of the National Anthem of the Republic of Barbados. Just maintain that position of reverence for the invocation of God's 
presence and blessing upon this evening's proceedings and I invite Miss Yvette, Yvette Lane Walker to do such. A blessed good evening to everyone. Can we please bow our heads? You look very lovely tonight. Almighty and everlasting Father, we give you thanks and praise God. Father God, we thank you for bringing us through this day. Father God, for this is a day that you have made. We definitely have rejoiced and we are glad in it. Father God, tonight I pray for everyone that would come to this podium. Father God, that they would minister powerfully to everyone in this audience, but specifically Santa Boyce as he shares his story. Father God, this is the month of the disabled and we're celebrating persons with disabilities. Father, as he will share, I pray God that lives will be enlightened, persons will be encouraged and empowered in the name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for bringing us here and Father God, those persons that are on their way, we pray that you will bring them here safely. And Father, now we pray in advance that as you would leave here, that you will continue to shield us from things seen and unseen and give us traveling mercies, God, to our homes in peace and in safety. Father God, continue to have your way in our lives as only you can. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we wish to invite the director of the National Disabilities Unit, Mr. John Hollisworth, to officially welcome you to this evening's proceedings. Mr. Hollisworth. Thank you, Master of Ceremonies. Honorable Kirk Humphrey, Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs, Mr. Edmund Hinkson, SCMP. Senator Andrele Boyce, our featured speaker. Staff of the Ministry of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs and the National Disabilities Unit. Officers and members of the Barbados Culture for the Disabled. Specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second in the series of public lectures entitled, This Is My Story, that has now become an integral part of the celebrations of the month of the disabled. The theme for the month this year is one community united in action. In keeping with this theme, the National Disabilities Unit has made a conscious effort to encourage participation from all actors in the quest to improve the lives of persons with disabilities in the activities of the month. Tonight is no different, as we have reached out to our partners, stakeholders, and those with general interest in the welfare of persons with disabilities to be part of this exercise. Your presence here tonight demonstrates your commitment to efforts. Those with disabilities are proud and supporters of this initiative. This is because public lecturers are normally associated with luminaries who are considered experts in a particular discipline or interest. It is not to say that our presenters are not luminaries in their own right, but we seek to engage those who have walked the walk and talk the talk. I believe we have done well so far, especially after the presentation last year from Ms. Janelle Odell. For those of you who were here, you know that what I'm talking about. Having started on such a high note, we had to maintain the momentum, and after some initial and vigorous head scratching, we identified Senator Andrea Boyce as the most suitable presenter for tonight. We wanted to present a different perspective on disability, as we had a blind person last year, we had a woman last year, so this year we wanted to go with a man with a different disability. <laughs> and in order to keep the high standards set last year, we kept everything else, minus the extravagant street stage decorations and other minor frills. We men don't care too much for those things. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to sit back and enjoy what promises to be a provocative and informative presentation. 
I have known Senator Boyce initially as a member of the committee to guide the establishment of a commission to improve the lives of persons with disabilities. For that experience, I have found him to be extremely committed and thoughtful in his deliberations. This attribute was further exemplified when he made a motivational presentation at the reception to honor special needs students who successfully completed the 11 plus examination. I therefore have no doubt that he will live up to all expectations tonight and propel, and propel sorry, this public lecture to join the pinnacle of such events on the national calendar. We at the National Disabilities Unit and the Ministry by Extension see it as our innate duty that all matters related to persons with disabilities receive the prominence that they deserve. This is not restricted to programs and services, but on all matters that impact on their lives and to sustain them in the psyche of all to achieve the changes we pursue. It is not my intention to prolong this welcome as this is a night for a lot of talking. Don't believe that it will end there though as if there's anything that will require action, whether from the speakers, from you the audience during the interactive session or otherwise informally when we enjoy our cocktails, rest assured that if they're worthy, they will get the required attention. I am pleased that you have decided to spend your valuable time at this event and we all welcome you, welcome you wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly, thank you. Continuing with our evening's proceeding, at this time, it's the, the pleasure of our mind to welcome our Minister of People and Parliament of the Affairs, the Honorable Kurt Humphrey, to deliver Minister's remark. Minister Humphrey. Good night, everyone. A very special good night to you, to my colleague, Edna Hinson, to all the other distinguished guests I see in the audience whose name I won't attempt to call because there's so many of you, which might mean all of you. And of course, to my very good friend and our guest speaker, Senator Andrilli Boyce, whom after I refer to as Andrilli. It is my pleasure to be here. You know, I believe, as I was sitting there, I believe that there are moments when I have to reflect on this minister thing and, and, and just feel tremendously grateful for the way that my own life has turned out. It could have gone completely differently, you know? And I reflect on it and I think about my mother as I do all the time, Cynthia, you know how it is. My mother used to play a song, y'all may know it, a Charlie Pride song. If you can see, if you can walk. If you can hear, if you can talk, you all know it, then be grateful. Anyway, be grateful for what you've got. Y'all don't know these songs. Y'all are, are too young. Sing to the crowd too young. And really, you brought up too many young people. But anyways, and then my mother used to tell me a story of a time when, of a man who was about to kill himself, and he got on a bill, and he was about to throw himself off, and all he had left was a banana. It was his last banana. And he ate this banana, he threw the skin away. He was about to jump when he saw people scampering to eat the banana skin. And he thought to himself, well then, if I'm in this position, they're obviously worse than me, but they're happy to be alive, then, then I must have something else to live for. And so I take the leadership in the Ministry of People Empowerment in that same context. You know, like I'm grateful to be here and, and believe that we all have something to contribute toward the development of, of this country and, and just toward life in itself. And having responsibility for persons with disabilities, gender issues, HIV, the elderly, what did I miss? Children, <laughs> you, you've seen that conversation very recently. And we're bringing that policy back, or that legislation back. And just the very difficult issues having had homelessness now, having had the opportunity to work on a number of these issues when I was younger, with Hamilton Lashley, but also before that, just doing community work, and recognizing that we have a lot of work to do in this country. But I am very pleased with the progress that we made in the last two years. 
I believe that we have done now a policy on perhaps all the important things in the ministry that I just mentioned, disabilities, elderly, gender, children, we're working on the legislation. And even though we've done all of that important work, and even though now there's more conversation because, you know, we just finished the budget and the estimates debate, and for the first time I think you're getting more conversation around social issues than you actually are around the economics of the budget. And even though we may have differing views, the fact is that people are talking about it. And that in itself, I think, is victory because people were not talking about these issues in a central way for a very long time. Hearing people talking about uh, what we should do for the elderly population, seniors, and better referred to, what we should do in addition to what we've done in the budget for persons with disabilities, heard more conversation now too around gender. It makes me very, very happy. As I said, even though we don't all agree, but the fact is that we are talking. And <clears throat> if you look at what we've done in the ministry as it relates to persons with disabilities specifically, and I wanna thank Edmund Hinkson, particularly for leading the committee that we had set up to begin this conversation, to look into the rights and improving the lives of persons with disabilities. In fact, please give Mr. Hinkson and his entire committee <laughs> a round of applause. And Andrea sat on that committee as well. Oh, I see Minister Chantal Manro Knight has also now joined us. Good night, Chantal. We've also done the draft legislation. That is now with the CPC. We expect to have that back and debated in Parliament this year to put in place legislation to improve the lives of persons with disabilities. And in the budget, you would have heard of a number. Oh, I see my other, I didn't see you when Peter Phillips, the MP for St. Lucie, also came in. I'm so happy to see my colleagues because, you know, this is what it's, it takes to be able to drive change. I saw the president of the Council for Persons, the Barbados Council for Persons with Disabilities here earlier, Carrie Ann Eiffel, but I don't see her now. Yeah. Oh, Carrie's right in the front. <laughs> oh, sorry, Carrie Ann. <laughs> Carrie Ann is my darling, she will forgive me. <laughs> you heard what she said? She said, uh, that's okay, did not see you either. <laughs> um, there's much love between the two of us. Anyway, we've done a lot of these things. The budget just, we just increased, I saw someone calculated as 161% the increase um, for, in terms of access uh, through the national insurance uh, scheme, which is a good thing. We've given it to more people 50% for children now, autism is going to be able to access it. Persons with Down syndrome, in fact, any person who's severely disabled is going to be able to access that financing. Um, I got a letter, a note from Roseanne too, that I don't see her. I, I, she told me this has been a conversation for 20 years or more that is going to make a difference in the lives of persons. I just feel like we're doing a lot of good things. And I'm really proud of the government, but I'm more so proud of the people because the people are now talking about it. And people want it. And, but more importantly, I think beyond all the statistics and the policies and the programs and the numbers, I think what is going to drive policy and what's going to drive change and what's going to move the hearts of people is actually story. The authentic, genuine story of a person who's lived a life with a disability and who can share that perspective in an honest, open way, and that is what this session is really about. For somebody to come and tell their story. I believe if you think about, if you go back to our roots in Africa, there are griots who, whose job it was to memorize for decades and centuries stories and pass them on. As our society is modernized, we kind of believe that the power of story should not be part of who we are. But it is a really a very big mistake that we are making. And I believe when this story is properly told, it will move the audience, but it will allow us to move policy. And those of us who have very good stories inside of us, which I really believe is all of us, we are duty bound to share those stories with the next generation so that they understand the struggle. But more importantly, so that they become part of the process of change. And I believe that in listening to Andrea tonight, we will be in a position to better do that. So I want to commend you. I listened to you in the Senate very recently. You were excellent. I trust you're going to be excellent this evening. 
I want to thank you too because Andrea recently joined the staff for the Ministry of People Empowerment as one of the advocates. <laughs> as well as Janiel Odo, who may be here, who I do not see, but I want to say it twice. Oh, she's over there. And she was excellent last year. In fact, give her a round of applause for last year's work. So thank you all. I just want to ask you to become partners with us as we try to push change. It's still going to be very important. The truth is that we still have a fight because a number of our employers do not want to hire persons with disabilities. Our policy, as Eddie knows, recommends a quota that persons should have to hire. But we know that persons should be able to do that of their own free choice. And we would rather have comp like voluntary compliance than be forcing persons to be able to do that. But that hopefully, these are the kind of things we need. But I want to thank you for being here, for being partners in this process of change. And I look forward to what this year has in store for all of us. And I look forward to having a better Barbados for persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. And from the Minister's deliberation, you can attest to the fact that it speaks to leadership. There's a saying, leadership is service, not position. So you can understand where our Honorable Minister is coming from. At this time, I wish to invite the presenter, who will give an introduction for and on behalf of our guest presenter tonight, the Honorable Edmund Hinkson, Senior Council Member of Parliament. Mr. Hinkson. Good evening, everyone. But of course, I wish to especially recognize the ministers here that Kurt and Dr. Chantel, who sits with Andrelli in the Senate, and parliamentary colleague Peter, and uh, of course, most honorable Kerry Ann Eiffel, and uh, Order of the Republic, Dr. Alison Leacock, and um, all the stakeholders in the cause of advancing the lives of people with disabilities, especially Rosanna Truda, who has been operational in this cause for so many years. Uh, cannot not recognize my mom here. And, <laughs> and my sister. And of course, uh, John, John Hollingsworth, the director, NDU. Stevenson, uh, but I'm here to introduce um, Senator Andrelli Boyce. Andrelli, you're calling. Uh, you know, if I'm going into a battle to wage war on behalf of persons with disabilities, I would have to have Andrelli with me in that fight because I know that with my life on the line, he is going to back me. He's going to be there. He's going to be loyal. He's going to be dedicated. And he's going to be dependable in the cause. I would have first met Andre Lee, I believe, in, in around 2013, when I came on as a director of the Barbados Council for the Disabled. Andre Lee had been on there between 2010 and 2014. Um, concurrently, he was at that time as well a uh, regional youth advisor to the United Nations Population Fund. Before that, he had won the Barbados National Youth Award, um, one of, and we, we started that again the, um, last year because youth have to be recognized, and Andre Lee was one of the winners for that award in 2009. And then in 2011, he, he won the Craig Nurse Award. And Craig Nurse, as you know, everyone um, who follows the disabilities cause knows, would have been an outstanding 
young individual person with disabilities, um, one of the first graduates from the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill, with a, dis with a disability. And he and Carrie Ann were pioneers in that regard. And uh, with, of course, Janil following on um, a little way after. Uh, and, and you, you know, you, you have to give credit to Common Mayor, especially, <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> especially for first time that they ever did the double, you know, the game, you know, like 50 with, that they did, that you did the double. Not in my time, no. <laughs> Not in my time. So, so we give credit for, for being um, the school that led the way in terms of accommodating uh, um, persons with disabilities in, in, you know, Carrie Ann and Jadee's case, blind. And Craig, yeah, and Craig as well, of course. And um, in his honor, there's the memorial prize for, for Craig and Andre really would have won that in 2011. Uh, recognize as well um, Senator Lisa Cummins, who just came in, leader, leader of government business in the Senate. And I'd like to give an excuse for uh, Ms. Cynthia Ford, MP, who, as you know, was here last year, but tonight is St. Thomas Feast. So, you know, excuse for her absence. But um, Andre Lee as well has worked in many places. He's worked at the University of the West Indies as a library assistant. He's worked with CBC as an intern journalist. He's been a columnist in um, Barbados today, and many persons who may not have known him before may have first um, had knowledge of him in that regard, writing a weekly column in, the, in Barbados today. He's worked as well with the United Nations Development Fund. Um, he has been public relations consultant in terms of youth camp to the National Conservation, sorry, National Cultural Foundation. And um, he's worked with the Caribbean Media Corporation as an intern as well. And, and you may wonder how Andre Lee was able to do all of this, and it, it isn't that he was a token person there because he had a disability. Because Andre Lee has two master's degrees um, in international trade policy. <laughs> international trade policy and um, political science as well. He has an associate degree in mass communications from Barbados Commun uh, Community College. He has two first degrees in law and in political science and law. So uh, when you're lying on, uh, uh, on really up against me, tell you the truth, I pale, <laughs> and I thought I had some university degrees. So Andrea Lee is just an outstanding individual, uh, someone who I'm proud to know and to be associated with and as chairman of the National Advisory Committee to establish um, you know, a better life for persons with disabilities, to establish a committee to deal with that. Uh, Andre Lee, as Curtis has said many, many times, we've had over 60 meetings between June 22 and March, end of March last year, and then again, Andre Lee and I would have um, gone out on public outreach for about six weeks in July, August last year. And out of those 60 plus meetings, I only remember Andre Lee missing three. One time he couldn't come because Senate, commitments in the Senate. Um, in fact, another time, he, I remember we were at Alexandra's and he left Senate uh, and came there. Afterwards, there was another time he was unwell and there was a, a one other time um, reliable to the T. And, uh, you know, is in the Senate now since January 2022, Andre Lee has served as a representative both for the youth and for persons with disabilities. 
I haven't listened to his speech yesterday. I heard some of it over the news this morning, and it is reported some of it again in the nation newspaper. Uh, practical, everything that we are looking to achieve, he spoke about yesterday. You would have seen him and Janil on TV yesterday morning, Barbados as well. On Monday, or oh, I watched it yesterday. With the technology now, you can play back a program uh, within 20, 24 hours. So uh, it was Monday, yeah. And um, Janil and Andre Lee now um, in house at the Ministry of People's Empowerment, as Kurt said, to advance the national policy on disabilities, which the cabinet has approved in September last year. And no two better people to do that than Janil and Andre Lee. And Andre Lee, as we see, has obviously mass communications, qualifications. And I, I was proud watching the two of them yesterday. Look forward to their further public outreach um, because one of the key issues here, everyone who knows about disabilities would say is the psyche of Barbadians and that's what we have to change to make Barbadians understand that people with disabilities have the same human and constitutional rights as everybody else, that they have the same um, rights to education and um, employment and good health access to everywhere in Barbados. And Andre really, again, in terms of education, being an advisory um, committee member to the on a CDB committee on inclusive education. So I'm sure that everyone, just as I am, looks forward in anticipation to his story as Kurt said, Janil's um, story last year was really moving, sent me to tears. And I'm sure that Andre Lee will do the same this evening. Thank you. Andre Lee. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This room feels like a warm hug. There are some of you whom I have not seen in a very long time, and it's great to see you. Let me level with you that I have a little bit of a sinus cough, so we're going to get through this together. Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs, the Honorable Kirk Humphrey, other members of the Cabinet of Barbados, MP Edmund Hinkson, other members of the lower house, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I cried during my um, Senate presentation yesterday, and I have promised myself not to repeat that this evening. Yes, <laughs> I can only cry once in a week. I'm not entirely sure where one begins telling the story of their life. But at the outset, let me say this. Sometimes it has been stories like mine that absolve us of the collective responsibility to improve the lives of persons with disabilities. It is been easy over the years to look at the relative success of some persons with disabilities and say, look, they survived and so can you. I'm going to ask that you don't take that from my story this evening. What I'm going to ask that you do take, though, is the resolve and the commitment to dismantling and shifting the realities that make my story to the extent that it is exceptional. Deal? Yes? Deal? Good. I imagine that almost 
immediately upon my birth. It was clear to my parents that raising me would be an exercise in faith and forbearance. An incredibly charming face and a body in an, in an experience or an experience in a body that there was no manual for. The eventual diagnosis of cerebral palsy was a relief to them. It gave them a reason for the fact that I entered the world early and at the very least needed more attention than my two brothers who preceded me. My early childhood was marked with doctor visits and therapy sessions. And as my mother tells me, many opinions about what I would never be able to do. And even in the face of professional pessimism, my parents believed. <laughs> by way of context, I was raised by a mother who believes that all things are possible. <laughs> Dr. Leacock nods knowingly. <laughs> She's easily the most optimistic person I have ever met. I said I wasn't going to cry. On the other hand, my mother is also one in the defense, she's fearless in the defense of her children. And dare I say, her sweetest child. My, <laughs> my brothers aren't here this evening, are they? Yes, we, I can get away with that this evening. To begin a sentence, and my father, has a quiet and stubborn resolve, and together, this makes them the perfect people to raise a child with a disability at a time when, according to most people, the prospects were not particularly good. And soon it became clear to my mother and father that they were going to be required to raise their voice again and again in defense of me and that they would at some point have to teach me to do the same. To make matters worse, a short time after my birth, I began experiencing issues with my eyesight that seemed more serious than initially thought. And after lots of consternation, expense, and trips overseas, I was diagnosed with retinoblastoma, cancer of the eye. These two diagnoses meant that I would spend lots of time out of the island seeking medical attention. In fact, it was one year, one term of every school year between five and 15. A frequent flyer, if you will. Not, not at all exciting, but a frequent flyer all the same. My childhood in the 1990s and early 2000s was marked by lots of trips to the Spikestown Public Library. And when the offerings of the library became too limited, negotiating with my father to take me to bookstores around the island. Books were a place where I got to travel and roam freely into worlds beyond the bones of the hospital and looking outside the expanse of the pasture that is behind our house, essentially. Through my reading, I developed a love of language and a curiosity about the world in which I lived. I delighted in both fiction and nonfiction, and perhaps to the surprise of many, the autobiographies of, or not to the surprise of many, the autobiographies of great leaders as well. My parents insisted that I watch the evening news and included me in conversations about national issues or the latest political gossip and encouraged me to develop perspectives on issues and to find honor, humor rather, in the midst and to of my situation and to think deeply. I am the youngest in a family of boys and while my brothers seem to almost instinctively understand my disability, they treated me no differently. I was required to be commanding and sharp 
and occasionally snarky, just occasionally. <laughs> Nothing else would do. I know there's no manual, but the greatest gift I have ever received was that of my parents who tried and who allowed me to be human and whole, not merely as a reflection of their best wishes for me, but as a human being with growing dreams and aspirations that did not always reflect their own desires. And so to the parents who loved, loved me, uh, who loved me anyway, but who merely, uh, and not who loved me anyway, <laughs> but who merely and simply loved me. Thank you. I come from a village in the country, a village in which family was close-knit, and within my first friends, beyond my brothers, were cousins who included me in everything that they were doing. So that while the others were playing football or cricket, and I was never interested in either of the two exercises, um, I don't know if that was a chicken and egg situation. It was because of the disability I wasn't interested or because I, you know. Um, they provided a space for me to enjoy the company and camaraderie and inclusion that made a difference in my life. Together, we laughed and conversed and my cousins raced on a supersonic red bicycle with three wheels that my parents bought me one summer after I decided that I wanted to ride bicycles like everybody else. <clears throat> oh. Outside my home though, it was in the classroom that I became acutely aware of, my limitation, of the limitations placed on me because of my disabilities. Not that my unique walk did not pose its own challenges, but I was singled out to be treated uniquely because of my disabilities. It was the 1990s and educational opportunities for persons with disabilities were limited. Despite those who had gone before, the education system was still confounded by me. Someone with cerebral palsy and attendant fine motor challenges that necessitated the use of leg braces and crutches and sometimes wheelchairs, but who had no intellectual challenges. Recall with me that the principal modality of the classroom in the 1990s was chalk and talk. I dare say even walk, chalk and talk. Teachers gave instructions exclusively through writing on the board or dictating, and your job was to copy and complete as quickly and as fulsomely as possible. My ability to do that was compromised by my diagnosis, and thus I struggled to take notes and complete assignments in the allotted time, but grasped information quickly and remembered it well. But a premium was placed on the things I could not do. Let me say that I had teachers, even in the midst of all of that, some of them here this evening, who encouraged me and who tried to do their best to accommodate me in the classroom. To Ms. Dean, who, in addition to making me a lover of language and a stickler for the proper use of grammar and pronunciation, and Ms. Jordan, who would copy notes and bring me to her desk and dictate and permit me to dictate my answers is to her. I am deeply grateful. They both became a buffer along with my family in making me confident in the fact that I was worthy and that I was as brilliant as anyone else. And anyone who held another view was entitled to be wrong. My best friend, a classmate of mine for much of my primary school life reminded me how badly I cried when these women left our school. I'm inclined to think that I was mourning a possibility I was not sure 
was available anywhere else. Let me take a quick diversion to tell you about my best friend. I met my best friend at six years old at one of the primary schools that I attended where he was instructed to look out for me. And let's just say he never stopped looking out for me. And we have formed a friendship that has lasted through the ages, the good times and that one month of bad times. <laughs> he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And to know us is to know that we are silly and that we laugh loudly at irreverent things and that we love Kaiso and Soka and dance hall. I digress. <laughs> My gratitude extends far and deep to those friends and cousins and teachers who on reflection it occurred to me that perhaps they didn't always know what they were doing. That they could not be sure that their efforts would mean anything in the long run. But I'm grateful to them for doing the right thing, even when it was easier for them to do anything. Eventually, though, the premium was placed on normalcy, both then and now. I'm, I, I'm not going to cry this evening. <laughs> and it made it so that teachers and educational technocrats shared the view that as a result of my disability, I, would not, I did not belong in a mainstream classroom, even despite evidence of my capacity. These indignities are not easily forgotten. The day an educator told my parents that I should not do the common entrance exam, but instead go to one of the vocational centers on the island is a day I will never forget. I can remember what my mother was wearing, a burgundy silk blouse where everything in that room was the miniature table, the brightly colored posters on the wall, and the color of the sheets I came home and flooded with tears. My parents became my fiercest advocate, taking on a system that was intent on not changing the way things were done, a reality that threatened to diminish my dreams of becoming whatever a son raised by a mother be who believed that all things were possible dreamed of becoming. I saw people with disabilities who were no less capable than me, but who did not have the relentless parents who had the wherewithal to navigate systems. And at that time, and in light of this, I developed the view that rights were important, if not essential, and it was critical for those rights to be enshrined in the systems that we develop. And we must develop those systems, develop systems that are permissive and accommodating of the dreams and aspirations of people, even and especially when they're different than us. Given the advocacy and the relentlessness of my mother and father, I was permitted to do the common entrance exam. <laughs> and secondary school permitted me the space to prove that I was able, after the bitter battle, to do the common entrance. Here was an, a, ch a chance for me to prove my mettle. Let's be clear, I have no romanticism about the common entrance. In fact, I think it the centerpiece of an elitist and colonial education system that fails too many, and it falls to us to reform it. I entirely enjoyed after Ellerslie, I entirely enjoyed my years as a student of mass communication. 
I remember my childhood almost exclusively through news events. The Oklahoma City bombing, Columbine, the death of Princess Diana, September 11th. I was interested in media from really young. Somehow, there was always an advocate newspaper in daddy's car in the early days after we got a vehicle. I don't know why, but there always was. <laughs> and Dr. Alison Lincock became my perennial companion at 7 p.m. in the evening. And that's where our love affair began. <laughs> I had the opportunity, as Eddie indicated, to intern at Media Houses, which provided me with the chance to learn about this country and this region while telling stories, which is still one of my favorite things. I entered the University of the West Indies to pursue a degree in political science and law, and from day one, thoroughly enjoyed it. Here I was engaged on issues that had long held my attention and interest. A highlight in my first year was Tracy Robinson's constitutional law class. She commanded the class and the material with such ease and made us all believe that we could be as bright as she was. In that class, you came into contact not only with the supreme law of the land, but with the problems and the promise of this Caribbean region. The class, that class and others underscored for me what I always knew, that prejudice and exclusion, that the prejudice and exclusion I faced existed alongside so many other instances where people were treated less favorably because of immutable characteristics, things they could do little about. When you, were taught, when you are taught by some of the people who taught me, who not only bring knowledge and pedagogical skills to bear, it is hard not to be optimistic about what this region can be. I have a little bit of a love affair with teachers, and so I speak of Tracy Robinson and Wendy Grenad and Professor Simeon McIntosh and countless others. I recall on my first day as an undergraduate student on the campus, Simeon McIntosh, who was then acting dean, called me to his office, and after a lengthy chat, he said, I don't know what the university provides for persons with disabilities, but if you need anything, you come find me. That began years of a relationship of encouragement, even in the darkest year, days of my sojourn. His words have never left me, words of encouragement that said you matter and that your words matter and the world needs you. I make that point, I tell you that story to perhaps make the point that good people matter as much as good systems. And so I encourage you to be good people. As I did indicated that while at the University of the West Indies, I somehow ended up on the board of the Barbados Council for the Disabled. I do not even and recall specifically how I imagine it was at the insistence of Bonita Phillips, who saw the late Bonita Phillips, who was a champion for persons with disabilities and whose tireless advocacy led to the improvement and uh, the broadening of our understanding about the realities of persons with disabilities. And the minister referred to the measures of the budget and the broader systemic work that the commission has started around disability. And sometimes I, I sit and think, what if she could see a world like this, a Barbados like this? This gave me 
my membership on the board gave me formal proximity to the issues of persons with disabilities and highlighted to me that my perspective as a young person could make a difference in their resolution. I must say thank you to the staff of the council who valued my voice and input in many of the council's major initiatives. And there are in some ways, they are in some ways the unsung heroes of this movement and I must take the opportunity to thank them, not only for their contribution to my development in this space, but for the work they do every day for persons with disabilities. Join me in applauding them. Allow me to flick back to 1999. <laughs> During the 1999 election, a teacher assigned a project for us to follow the elections, the candidates, the manifestos, the speeches. And this is where I fell in love with politics. I recall that election as exciting, not only for its fairly historic results, but also for all of its very entertaining side shows. <laughs> I have observed many campaigns since then, but none of them are as have been as entertaining. It was in that election that I attended political meetings and experienced the energy and the buzz of those gatherings. I saw individuals who would come to help direct the progress of this country for many years to come. I was at the time grappling with the particulars of disability and realized that the decisions governments made were critical to the fortunes of ordinary people like me. And as a result, in the aftermath of the 1999 election, I sat in the corner of my childhood bedroom and wrote a letter to the re-elected Prime Minister of Barbados, Owen Arthur, asking, him what he and his re-elected admi administration would do about disability education. He invited me to government headquarters and we dialogued. A, a now twice elected prime minister took my concerns and perhaps what others may have conceived of as my precociousness, he took genuine interest. I was nine, 10, it, I was born in 1989, yeah, I was 10 years old. <laughs> and in part, it ignited in me the belief that through my action, there was, a, there was a space to contribute and to advance disability policy in this country. In every conversation we had since, he shared what he hoped to do for persons with disabilities. And the fact that I get to be some small part of, <laughs> you're kind, some small part of continuing that work means the world to me. <laughs> Fast forward to January of 2022, I was sitting and minding my business, as some of us like to say. <laughs> Senator Cummins nods knowingly. <laughs> After a long day of meetings, I received a call and I neither recognized the number nor the voice on the other end. And that is ironic. <laughs> the voice introduced herself only as Mia. And then my tired brain figured out that it was the Prime Minister of Barbados and that she would go on to invite me into the upper house. <laughs> the ensuing days were filled with calls and congratulatory messages, but the weight of the appointment only truly sunk in on the morning of the swearing-in ceremony. And there I was, gathered with individuals, some of whom, whose names I learnt because of that assignment to chronicle the election of 1999. I remember signing the requisite documents in State House and across the room, Madam Deputy President looked at me and she said, are you nervous? And I said, yes. <laughs> Deputy President of the Senate, of course. And I said, yes. She 
And she said, you're supposed to be. <laughs> she hasn't stopped ribbing me since. In many ways, contributing to the development of policy and law to protect persons with disabilities is a full circle moment. This is the thing that I and so many children with disabilities needed 20 and 30 years ago. It is unfinished work. And I do this very important work so that another child doesn't have to go through the indignity of hearing <laughs> of hearing how they're just not good enough, how their country is not prepared to make space for their capacity and contribution, how the promise of their country is only a pinky promise to them. Systems must be made better so that another student with a disability doesn't have to recall exclusion. The majority of Barbadians, I believe, want to do the right thing. But I think that they want to know how to do the right thing. I think that, that is something that the, con the expansive consultations that the the committee engaged in reviewed. So many people with whom we consulted said to us subtly that they did not know how to help people with disabilities. They did not know how to make a difference in their own corners. I also know that as a country, we have the ability to look at the perennial issues, those we have ignored for too long, and say that the time has come for us to fix them. Our country is better for the reality for, and for the grappling with it. Our social policy, as I said yesterday in the Senate, is replete with examples. The Family Law Act, our early progress around SRH legislation, and the initial steps around free education we can do this again. And in relation to disability and, other, and many other matters that ail us. In reflecting on the Barbados of yesteryear, there is and was much that was good about Barbados in my growing up, in my mother's growing up, and in my father's growing up, and in my grandmother's growing up. There was much to be learned from the spirit of small villages and resilient families living in the shadows of plantations. As I reflect on a life like mine, let it be absolutely clear that while there was much of doing good and doing better in my growing up and my mother's growing up and my grandmother's growing up, so much would have made a difference to those individuals. And I come, as I come close to sharing these early chapters of my life with you, allow me to share the love of my, the love I have for my grandmother. She's not gonna cry. My grandmother is one of the great loves of my life. I believe I said it yesterday in the Senate. And I have learned so much from her. If you are around me often enough, it won't be long before I recall some saying from my grandmother, some story from the times I spent with her in New York while seeking medical attention. During that period, she was a pillar of support, building, and we built a bond that is unmatched. <laughs> and has not faded even as her memory now fades, given the ravages of dementia. A friend of mine said to me recently, your grandmother has lost her memory, but it seems she has left it to you. <laughs> Forgive me for sharing the poet in me, the lover of words and language, held 
by the hearts of the educators and mentors, some of whom I have mentioned in summers filled with words in honor of my dear grandmother. If a boy's ability to change the world grows in direct relation to the lessons he learned from his grandmother, then any history I make must be credited to a woman from the country, a woman who left her own to find work in other fields, the baby of a family, my mother's mother, and my greatest teacher. Gran taught me to be proper but not pious, like all the times, <laughs> like all the times she reminded me that intimacy is not a bad thing. <laughs> to ask what I want to know, like all the times she told me to ask, like the time she told me to ask the doctor if I would see with a marble eye. I asked her and she said, ask the doctor. <laughs> to be loud when the ends justify the means. Like the April afternoon, she blocked a New York City hospital waiting area to get me the treatment I deserved. To pay attention to details like when she would make me watch her favorite soap operas and tell her exactly what happened when she got home. <laughs> to accept that good things come from bad experiences, like each time she forced me to drink tomato juice because it would help with the cancer. To know that memories are all that we have and that you never quite know what you have until it's gone. Like the first time, she didn't remember my name. I miss the light in her eyes and her irreverence and her deep belief in me. She will celebrate her 81st birthday tomorrow. but because of the ravages of dementia could not be with us this evening. Because of those experiences and the deep beliefs of women like my grandmother and my mother, I work to make sure that this country treats people with disabilities well to remind us that we are people with talents and dreams and aspirations and that Barbados as a country needs to be and can be better for us. Better not just for people with disabilities, but for children and women and all Barbadians who by the nature of who they are suffer exclusion and marginalization. We can take the lessons of small villages and families and mothers and grandmothers and translate them into a politics and a policy of love and care so that we build a better Barbados now. Granny, happy birthday. <laughs> and that's it, folks. I, I ended up crying anyway.
Yeah, so the three plus is okay. Three. You're good? Yeah. At this time, we'll have an interactive session with our guest presenter. And we, he would indulge you in a few questions at this time. So those who wish to engage, just indicate and there are mics in the pathway for you to inquire or to ask. Good night. Good evening. I don't have a question. I just want to make a statement. I fell in love with Angelina from the first time I met him. <laughs> and his mother knows that, and she's a bit jealous. But <laughs> <laughs> when she saw me tonight, she said, I know you would be here. And of course, Angelina didn't know it would be here. And after hearing your story, and they want to probably say, I love you even more. Thank you. Thank you so much, love. <laughs> I see I, I see Admiral Hinkson rising. Yeah. And really, of course, you have had you know, the opportunity not only to be on the commission of which we spoke, but also to be committee member uh, to the Inclusive Education Committee that the Caribbean Development Bank has, and I believe to the Ministry of Education as well. You, yes. know, you and Kerry Ann yes. and Janine have sat on committees to see how um, we could more include children with disabilities within the mainstream of our education. And, you know, I'd like you to give, in fact, at least I invite you to give the audience, you know, your perspective on how the government of Barbados, policy makers can look to, within the net, by 2030, because the national policy document is a seven-year plan starting from last year and could move towards that and of course for you to speak a bit towards the um, rights of persons with disabilities bill that is now before the ministry of which you are part <laughs> and how that will deal with education of persons, children with disabilities. Thanks Eddie. I think as we all know, Edmund Hinkson has been a fearless champion of persons with disabilities himself. He talks about when we were, when <coughs> he was chairing the commission um, on disability. Um, Eddie's passion is one of the most inspiring thi things that I have witnessed in Barbadian public service. He also calls you at 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> the national policy and, and law in relation to persons with disabilities, as Eddie indicated, spans seven years uh, and is broken down, the policy this is, into short-term, short medium-term, and long-term goals. Um, and I, Eddie has asked that I speak specifically to education. Uh, and let me begin by saying that we have to reform Barbados's education system in the name and in the interest of persons with disabilities. The education system is largely too segregated. Uh, there are examples of people whose names we know. There's Carrie Ann and the late Craig Nurse, whom I think I miss desperately um, because his example meant so much to me. But um, 
but there, there are people whose names we do not know who, like I indicated this evening with my story, have the ability and the capacity to participate in the in an education system that is more permissive and permits them to reach their full potential. And that is what the policy is intended to do. In relation to, to education, it does, it commits to doing things like providing aids and accommodation for persons with, with disabilities in the context of the classroom. It commits to, as far as is possible, and certainly with the, um, the construction of new plant and infrastructure that we build infrastructure that is universally designed. And so that persons with disabilities can move through schools. Yesterday I told the story of being a person in a wheelchair for some short period and not having a desk to sit at. And the, some staff member of the school said to my parents and I, perhaps y'all should build a desk. Um, with no twinge in her conscience or irony or anything. But I say that to make the point that we have to and policymakers, your question was specific to policymakers, have to participate in making schools and education facilities more accessible to persons with disabilities in a whole host of ways. The modalities that are necessary for a person on the autism spectrum, for instance, to learn and to participate in a classroom may be different than the chalk and talk of the education system. And perhaps the point that I'm making is that the, the policy asks that we reimagine education in the names and in the interest of persons with disabilities and policymakers have to participate in that. It goes, it is the full gamut of the education system. This is not a political speech. Um, I have heard some comments recently about curricula and no further. And I say, in, wh in whose name and in whose interest? <laughs> I'm not touching the political stuff. <laughs> I really wanted to congratulate you, Senator, but also to tri pay tribute to your parents, <laughs> who I observed <laughs> in a past life mm. as the CEO of the NCF. Yes. And I witnessed this youngster coming to a Christmas party you were having. I'm like, this guy is so feisty. She was Ooh. Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> so I really <laughs> wanted to say that you embody true transformation. Yes. You've taken it upon yourself yes. as an individual to move every boundary that was before you and to surpass people's expectations, not for them, but for you. And for that, I give you kudos. Congratulations. I have to... Thank you, Dr. Leacock. I have to pay tribute to Dr. Leacock because she tells half the story about that Christmas party uh, at the National Cultural Foundation because in those years, the foundation supported the, I forget the name now, but it, it was the children's home for, for persons with disabilities. And she has been passionate about disability for as long as I have known her. And I want to thank her. Oh, easy, easy, easy. 
is the rest of us. <laughs> I want to pay tribute to you for your commitment to inclusion and for your example to me specifically. So thank you. At this time, we recognize our, our We recognize you, Mr. Carter. Senator Cummins. Senator Cummins. So we then in Mr. Carter and Senator Cummins after this young lady. She looks really good. Yeah. Good night. Um, also, when, also has your name. Okay. Good night. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Not being rude or anything. Mm -hmm. You speak so flawless. Can you speak any better? <laughs> <laughs> not being rude or anything. It's just, it, I mean, everything is so pure. <laughs> I know I dispute Beethoven, but you are so flawless. <laughs> <laughs> can you do anything? Thank, for thank me you. Thank you. I I can speak Beethoven. You come to <laughs> share you. me to hear the name, but. <laughs> <laughs> Rosling. Rosling has the name. Good night, everybody. I sit here, Mister Angela. If you don't call your name properly, you understand. Yeah. I am proud of you as a person who is a citizen of And then I sit here and listen to you about your schooling. I experienced a lot of that. <laughs> but thank God that uh, you were strong enough to fight the system. I, I surrendered to the system. Although my parents, the guess of your parents, the, and I know the guess of your mother, God bless good mothers. God Don't bless good mothers. <laughs> Don't get together sad with that mother's fight and fight. I, I am proud of you. I, I, I am honored to see that you will carry on the mantle when we the old uh, this is a person is gone. And you will let people see that sort of proud of each person. Don't let them walk condition in. They have a being, a wonderful being. And if they have opportunity for access to school system, I, I call Mr. Hinson is listening to the school for access to speak skeletons. All of those things. Nothing is wrong with our brain. Some of can't speak, but your brain is very good. So I congratulate you. Have a good night. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> Carson? Granville, um, just put your hands so the. Good night, everyone. Good night. Yes, uh, Mr. Andretti, uh, good presentation. Um, <coughs> Thank you. Having, having a partner, I had a partner for who would know. Um, I was married to someone with cerebral palsy, and I know some of the challenges that they would have spoken about even to go to a school or even a regular school. Uh, 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 let's say normal setting of a school, and I know how she managed. How she told me how she must, how she had managed to get into the regular setting of Charles F. Bloom because she was multi, <laughs> as she would say, and they were getting ready to put her in the special annex. But when the principal, she answered a question, and principal said, "No, she doesn't belong in there. She belongs over there." 
So sometimes it's good to let the children express themselves, and it's good that you have parents that were able to help fight the cause. But my main thing I'm going to ask you about is you, you mentioned you would have gone to Ellerslie. Uh, how at secondary school was your interaction with the students and the teachers? And were there any major challenges? Or who, any major challenges at, at that point? Yes, there were, <laughs> there were challenges. But there were also teachers that, some of them here this evening, I, I, I'm looking directly in the eyes of my, of my first form year head who became a champion for me on day one. And her commitment to my inclusion in the classroom and in the school generally um, was is was unmatched. I think that sometimes peer, um, teachers, other adults need to model behavior for their cho for children, and they have to. I don't think that children are born prejudiced or intolerant. Uh, and we teach them intolerance by the way that we behave. And so, like I said, in your small corners, I ask that you, wherever you are, model the inclusion that we want to create in this society. There were challenges. Um, like I said, there was, there's that, story of the death that I recall yesterday, that I recalled yesterday. There was, ch and children say things and, and, you know, have opinions about things. Um, my, my ability to retort it is legendary. So um, I perhaps gave as good as I got on some occasions, but just to make the point that we have to model the kind of society and the kind of institutions that we want to create in this society and not, and not worry about how children will respond to difference, but teach them by our example how to respond to difference. Okay. Senator Cummings? I want to thank my Senate colleagues. I think you should start your speech. Okay, first. okay, all right. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was coming to thank Andrele first because uh, we just finished Senate, so it's a Monroe and I, Monroe night and night we're here, but all of the Senate colleagues wanted to be here, not just on the government side, but the independent colleagues, the opposition colleagues, because Andrele is not just a Senate colleague, but he is a champion for persons with disabilities who has become very well respected at the Senate. And if you saw the newspaper this morning of <laughs> and, and the commentary on his speech, it will give you a little insight as to what happened in the Senate yesterday. And I want to give a backstory and call him out a little bit. Because when Andrele first joined the Senate, he was nervous. <laughs> and he remained nervous for a while. And every time Andrele stood to speak on a given subject, he stood to speak and he had his note and he was very <laughs> careful. And then one day he spoke for the first time in a dedicated speech on persons with disabilities. And it was his most outstanding speech ever. <laughs> when the Senate resumed this year, I remember in our pre-Senate briefings, I said to Andrea, and I said, put down <laughs> your notes. <laughs> and begin to get comfortable with your material. Yesterday, as Andrele stood to speak, Andrele started with his notes. And I said to my colleague, Senator Walker, who was sitting next to me, I talked to this boy already. <laughs> 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 I told him he needs to have the confidence that he has mastered his own voice, and he is confident in his material because this is something he lives every day. I watched Andrele put down the notes and refer to it intermittently 
but he spoke from his heart and he cried for the first time this week, the second time was today, and the newspaper accurately reflected that the entire Senate chamber was hushed and listening in rapt attention to someone whom we hold in high regard, have a tremendous amount of support for, and I sit here tonight, not just on my own behalf as leader of government business in the Senate, but on behalf of the entire Senate who sent their best wishes here tonight for you and their absolute support for your voice and for you just because you are. Thank you, Lisa. Before she was my Senate colleague, she tutored in the international, the Masters in International Trade Policy program, so we go back. Karen, the floor is evening, yours, everyone. my dear. It would be remiss of me, because I like to talk too, <laughs> to sit here and not come and say that as a person with a disability, no, scrap that. I am proud of you. Thank not you. because you have a disability. Not because, you know, you got a sweet mouth. I, I love you. you know. <laughs> but because you delivered an excellent representation of what we want our Barbados to be. On behalf of the Barbados Council for the Disabled, I thank you for recognizing the role we played. Small, but we played a role. So I thank you on behalf of the council. But most importantly, I thank you on behalf of the staff of the Barbados Council for the Disabled. We do have one of the most dedicated, loving, supportive, overprotective, hardworking. Did I mention dedicated, mm -hmm. hardworking? Oh, yeah. All right, right. So <laughs> each one of them, each one of them comes to work every day and gives of their best because they believe in people like you and people like me. And a lot of people say, oh, they don't have disabilities. They don't know. But they all do. Even the newest staff members. So on behalf of the staff of the Barbados Council for the Disabled, the directors, the affiliated organizations, I want to thank you for your exceptional presentation and for your acknowledgement of the work that they do. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> no, no, but I have to say before I leave this microphone in, and it is perhaps a perfect response to you, I also have to pay tribute to Roseanne Foster Vaughn, who was a person who adored me and I adored her and I miss her dearly. And I could not leave this podium this evening um, having paid tribute to the, the current staff of the Barbados Council for the Disabled without paying tribute to her. Thank you. Sure, I am told there are two more questions. The young one here. And Kev? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lola. Hello, good night. Good night. Wait, hello, good night. Good night. Clap for that. Um, I don't really have much to say, but I just, I'm very happy that I got this opportunity to come here and be enlightened on specific things that we were ignorant to in this day and society. So I am giving you a thank you from our principal, Mrs. Baptiste. Uh, our fellow students here who came here today to watch and listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that is what the work is about, huh? That
In everything, God first, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Amen. Good evening to Minister Humphrey and other members of the cabinet, other members of parliament, to Senator Boyce. Good evening. To Most Honorable Kerry Ann Eiffel, other respected brothers and sisters. I stand here to acknowledge the contribution of your grandmother who put me in contact with your mother for years. Mm -hmm. I attended, a, for everyone's uh, information, I attended the recent service to mark this month of the disabled at St. David's. Anglican Church, and when I got there, I was assigned or ushered, ushered to the seat, to sit next to Senator Boyce, not knowing what was going on, what I was being put into. And next to him was his mother, with whom I grew up in the same household. In those days, people used to raise people's children. And that is how I being raised by my aunt and his mother, Wilma, was raised by my aunt at the same time. I wish to congratulate you. Thank you very much for your presentation and wish you all the best. I'm the one who raised the three cheers for your grandmother. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You made me cry, but thank you. Thank you, Senator Boyce. for imploring us to recognize words that were spoken by someone as esteemed as Mahatma Gandhi, that you must be the change you want to see in this world, right? That your life does not get better by chance. It gets better by change. And it is our desired hope that when you leave here this evening, you take that to heart and every little opportunity you get to be the change that you want to see in your space, you'll be that change. Thank you, Senator Boyce, for your inspiring words. At this time, um, as the director has already said, there'll be a lot of long talk this evening, but at this time, we are bringing it home. I wish to invite Miss Dion Watson, a colleague at the National Disabilities Unit, to bring you the vote of thanks. Mrs. Watson. to everyone. I'm here to give the vote of thanks. I hope this vote of thanks is one that gets to the audience because I was not prepared for the vote of thanks even though I knew I had to do the vote of thanks. I somewhat was not prepared but God is good. Sorry. Okay. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. And before you, we wouldn't have had a, a lecture, because you know why it is that we plan for this lecture, we turn up, the ministry, the personnel turn up, the senator turn up, and no one was here. This wouldn't be the top of the lecture. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. First, I want to thank the man of the hour, the senator, and really, thank you very much. You were sweating in the beginning. <laughs> and I was wondering what you were sweating because everybody was, was saying they were cold. But I guess that was like nervousness. But you were awesome. You were awesome. And I told you, 
you are going to be good because I remember when we had the graduation for the children and you left this court with the children. The sky is not the limit. I am, and I remember that. And when I see persons with disabilities, I give it to them. I think I gave it to my client last week, and he came in this evening. He just became an amputee. And I don't want to shout you out, but I'm glad you are here. And your mom, I'm glad she brought you out this evening. The sky is not the limit. You are. Okay? You know who you are. Uh, we want to thank, let me go in order of ceremony now, Miss Yvette Lane Walker for her invocation. We cannot do anything without prayer. Thank you very much, Miss Lane Walker. We want to thank our director, Mr. John Hollisworth, who would have given the welcome. You know, Mr. Hollisworth is very, very good at writing. That is an art he has. And I thank you because we don't even have to hurt our head with scripts or anything. We just let the director take over. Thank you, Mr. Hollisworth. And at this time, and also thank you, Mr. Hollisworth, I want to thank the staff, the team at the National Disabilities Unit. Can the team from the National Disabilities Unit please stand? I want Carrie, the envoy, Miss. Lynn Walker, everybody that's here from the National Disabilities Unit this evening, Mr. Nurse, our assistant director. These are the ones that will be instrumental in the lecture and pulling off the month of the disabled. Thank you very much. This is unusual, sir. This is unusual, but I really feel, I really feel that we really have to thank the staff because yes. I don't think you all know how much work they actually do and the work they've done. Please give them a massive round of applause to John Hollingsworth and the team and to yourself. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Minister. I know we work really hard. We might be a small unit, and you know what hurts me? I only went to the unit last year in February, and when I went to the mun unit, I said, wait, this unit will they do? And accustomed to the department being so dead. But then when I look at the work that we put in on a daily basis, our unit ain't dead. It's just that persons who have to access that service know about the unit. But I'm thankful that the unit is there. And the men at the unit work so hard from our drivers to the general workers, you know, even the security at the unit. Good evening, Karen. <laughs> you know, we all work hard on a daily basis, and we could not do it. We are like a family now, you know? So thank you, team members. Thank you very much. We want to thank our minister, Humphreys, who would have given us the, um, the presentation this evening and the minister's remarks. We have one of the best ministers. I do think so. <laughs> I do think so. And I know why I know why you are so good at this job, because you're a social worker and you have that heart. I know that's your first love. I know, I do believe so. We want to thank our permanent secretary, Mr. Wilcher. He's here. So don't say because he's not up front, he's not here, he's here. Thank you. Good evening, Miss P. S. Wilcher. We want to thank all of the invited, our deputy permanent secretary, I didn't see Mr. Franklin. He's not here, but nonetheless, I still mention him. Our assistant director, Mr. Nurse, very quiet, as usual. Can't be missed, but good evening, Mr. Nurse. <laughs> we want to thank you all for being here. And, you know, as the senator was giving his story, it really, you know, some segments of it that really reached out to me was his parents, his grandparents. You see that support system for a person that is disabled? That is how far you can go with your strong support system. When you don't have a support system as a person with a disability, you don't get where you will want to be. But because the senator had such good parents and a good grandmother, and I show good neighbors, good brothers, good friends, you know? 
good persons around him, that strength that he had is what carried him to be where he is today. The sky is not the limit you are. And I know it as a mother, a support system for a child. I know it. I do it every day. And you mentioned some of the things. You mentioned as the world needs good people, good people matter. And he encouraged us to be good people. And the scripture talks about doing good. And it speaks about love that is patient, is kind, is not easily angered, and is not quick to wrongdoings, and if some of us would just push that love in a different direction, this world would be a better place. And at this time, <laughs> I thank you all. I thank you all. At this time, we are going to do something very different. I want to thank the master of ceremonies. Don't think I forgot to. <laughs> My colleague, Mr. Evelyn. I can tell you something. We cannot get along for a second. personality and my personality mm -mm. <laughs> but nonetheless we work together as a team and that's what comes to our persons would not even know that <laughs> I want I want to call the minister to the podium and on behalf of the National Disabilities Unit, we want to present Mr. Evelyn with something very special, a certificate. Uh, and this certificate was signed by the director and the minister. Mr. Evelyn, please come. I didn't know, didn't 22 years for working with persons with disabilities. You know, last year when we were doing our monument, and he, we say, Mr. Evelyn, you know you should be one of the persons being honored. And he didn't want it because he didn't want to be in the four or wanted to be in the limelight, as we will say, because he always talk about his people. We set standards. Others only try to imitate. And it's true. We do. We do set standards. And at this time, I'm going to give the minister the certificate to present to Mr. Evelyn. Thank you, everybody. There's a certificate of appreciation. This certificate is a proud accompaniment of the award to be presented to Mr. Stevenson Evelyn in recognition of the dedication and hard work made to the National Disabilities Unit over the past 22 years. Probably if we would have told him that he was getting that certificate tonight, he probably wouldn't even have showed up. <laughs> anyway, we've come to the end of the night, and it brings down the curtain on the month of the disabled. But at this time, I want to thank the group that came out from LSB School. We want to thank the principal. I know you miss principal because my son went there, and you were the health and family life teacher back then. And we want to thank you guys for coming out because I knew that this, lecture would have been one for teens. And you know, as I was handing out the, the flyers, and I used to tell persons, bring your teens, bring your young people, because we have able-bodied young people that don't reach their potential, but maybe they're seeing someone who has a disability that would have achieved so much, they might just change their mindset and want to do better for themselves. So thank you to you, the group from the LSD school. Thank you for the principal and the teachers that came out. Okay. At this time, we want to present the senator with a token of our appreciation, Ms. Codrington Holder, who has worked very feverishly behind the scenes in pulling together this entire lecture tonight. She's going to present the senator with a token from the National Disabilities Unit.
before I leave, I want to leave two quotes. And you know, I just chose out these two quotes, but I didn't know that they would have really take effect to this evening. And my two quotes are on strength. That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Stre quote number two. Strength and growth come only through continuous effort and struggle. So I leave that with you tonight. Have a good night.